So what does the research show regarding disease and mortality outcomes associated with low-carbohydrate diets? In this video, I will discuss this question for low-carb diets in general. In a subsequent video, I will focus more specifically on the keto diet. Fad diets, including low-carb diets, promise and may even deliver rapid weight loss offering a short-term solution to a persistent problem. More importantly, short-term benefits such as weight loss should not be confused with improved long-term health outcomes. It is imprudent to assume that improvements in one or two metabolic parameters translates to longer life and increased health span. Reductions in blood sugar, A1C, cholesterol, and weight can all be achieved by using cocaine or getting cancer. Ill-advised strategies for long-term health, to say the least. And yes, cocaine can make you feel really, really good, or so I've heard. This meta-analysis of low-carb diets reported a 30% increased risk of all-cause mortality. To quote, our systematic review and meta-analysis of worldwide reports suggested that low-carbohydrate diets were associated with a significantly higher risk of all-cause mortality in the long run. These findings support the hypothesis that the short-term benefits of low-carbohydrate diets for weight loss are potentially irrelevant. This 2019 study, published in the European Heart Journal, prospectively examined the relationship between low-carb diets and all-cause and cause-specific mortality, i.e. cardiovascular disease, stroke, and cancer, in a large U.S. cohort. After adjustments were made for age, sex, race, education, smoking, BMI, diabetes, high cholesterol, and hypertension, those with the lowest carbohydrate intake had a 32% increased risk for all-cause mortality. Moreover, risk for deaths from cardiovascular disease, stroke, and cancer increased 50%, 51%, and 36% respectively. The results were dose-dependent, in that the lower the carbohydrate intake, the higher the risk of dying. The study also pooled nine prospective studies. Findings from this pooled analysis also indicated an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer deaths with low-carb diets. Now, I can hear low-carb peddlers crying, correlation is not causation. The implication being that all epidemiological studies that do not fit with the reductionist view of nutrition are therefore flawed and should be largely ignored. However, population studies such as these are critically important to our understanding of the best diet for human health as they provide insight into health outcomes over a long period of time and provide scope, i.e. across a broad spectrum of people. And when they consistently come to the same conclusion, then well, where there is smoke, there is usually fire. But of course, one can't just stop there. It is also important to then examine questions of biological plausibility and to look at randomized controlled trials in order to gain an understanding of what the balance of evidence shows. I will say that I'm not a fan of just looking at low carb or high fat or high protein as that is a very reductionist approach to nutrition. By reductionist, I mean looking at isolated nutrients and health outcomes. We don't tend to eat nutrients in isolation. Thus, saying your diet is low in fat or high in protein does nothing to inform as to the healthfulness of said diet. Indeed, there are multiple ways to eat unhealthy, and Americans seem bent on exploring them all. A number of studies have compared low-carb plant-based diets to low-carb animal-based diets. While both patterns were low in carbs, more favorable health outcomes were associated with the plant-based compared to the animal-based pattern. One such study was this prospective study out of Harvard, which compared a low-carb plant-based to a low-carbohydrate animal-based diet. What they found was, and I quote, a low-carbohydrate diet based on animal sources was associated with higher all-cause mortality in both men and women, whereas a vegetable-based low-carbohydrate diet was associated with lower all-cause and cardiovascular disease mortality rates, end quote. Thus, relative to the animal-based pattern, the plant-based pattern was a striking improvement. Thus, it is more useful to examine eating patterns and the types of foods consumed rather than just looking at isolated nutrients. Chickpeas and chicken both contain protein, but one comes with fiber and phytonutrients, which are health-promoting, the other with cholesterol, saturated fat, heterocycline amines, preformed arachidonic acid, advanced glycation end products, bacterial endotoxins, and promotes the production of trimethylamine by the gut bacteria, all of which are disease-promoting. Now, when it comes to amino acids for muscle protein synthesis, the body doesn't care where they come from, chickpeas or chicken. But from a long-term health perspective, the types of foods we consume on a regular basis matters. 
Traditional ethnic diet patterns high in starches and carbohydrate rich whole foods as found in parts of Africa, Asia and Central America have shown to result in low rates of coronary heart disease and other chronic conditions. This is true regardless of the carbohydrate containing staple such as rice in most Asian countries, rice and beans in Central America and a range of cereals and root crops like sweet potatoes and beans in different parts of Africa. To date, every population group found to experience vitality and longevity consumes a dietary pattern rich in minimally processed carbohydrate and nutrient-rich plant foods. I have yet to see examples of the opposite. In countries like Uganda and Okinawa, autopsied and pathological verified studies show that conditions like heart disease were extremely low, or as one paper put it, almost non-existent. This paper published in 1960 on the African population in Uganda reported that out of over 1,400 autopsies, only one person showed slight evidence of a myocardial infarction. Their diet staples were sweet potatoes, yams, maize, millet, vegetables, and cassava, all carbohydrate-rich foods. Studies of Okinawans showed that out of 300 autopsies, fewer than 5% had evidence of arterial plaque. Contrast that with the autopsied results of young adults from the US, where over 90% showed early evidence of arterial plaque buildup. 85% of the Okinawan diet came from carbohydrates, of which 69% was from sweet potato. Consumption of fish, by the way, was quite low. But what about intervention studies? This study was published on people who were recovering from a heart attack. Initially, all of the subjects were put on a healthy, plant-based diet, but about half of the patients subsequently switched to a low-carbohydrate diet. It was not plant-based. After a year, their heart scans were repeated. Those sticking to the high carbohydrate plant-based diet showed reversal of their heart disease. They had 20% less atherosclerotic plaque in their arteries and saw improvements in their heart function and coronary blood flow. Those who jumped on the low carbohydrate wagon, on the other hand, had significantly worsened plaque. Their arteries were about 40% more clogged Risk factors such as fibrinogen and LPA and inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein also increased significantly. Additionally, they all had worsened coronary blood flow. Other studies have shown that plant-exclusive diets are indicated for reversal of arterial plaque and prevention of future heart attacks. In fact, results from these studies are quite dramatic in some cases. In the case of Ornish et al., it's a whole foods, plant-based diet. A dozen men and women who were so sick they needed a heart transplant, which is kind of the ultimate high-tech intervention. And they went through our program and while they were waiting for a donor, and they got so much better they didn't need a heart transplant anymore. It's like, what's the more radical intervention here? Eat well, move... Now, there are a number of biologically plausible reasons as to why a low-carbohydrate diet would be harmful to long-term health, one being the impact to our gut bacteria or our microbiome. When it comes to our microbiome, there are three things that are important. Prebiotics, probiotics, or friendly bacteria, and postbiotics. Prebiotics are something called MAX. Now don't get too excited, these are not Big Macs, rather they are microbiota accessible carbohydrates. MACs are essential food for our friendly gut bacteria. This is what they thrive on. MAX consists of dietary fiber and resistant starches found in starchy foods such as potatoes and which are sourced from the very carbohydrate rich foods that low-carb diets shun, i.e. legumes, root vegetables, fruit, and whole grains. Insufficient intake of MAX causes something called dysbiosis, which is an imbalance between our good and bad bacteria. It also results in reduced diversity of our gut bacteria. Our general consumption of MAC-rich foods is at an all-time low. In fact, 97% of Americans are deficient in fiber. Also of note, many Americans believe that steak is a good source of fiber. Alas, it is not. Rather, plants have a total monopoly on this nutrient. Researchers referred to this low fiber intake as the fiber gap, as one paper put it. Actually, the real fiber gap for ideal health and maintaining microbial diversity might be even more serious than currently appreciated." End quote. The paper went on to say that this gap is a key driving force to the decrease in microorganism diversity, or what they called the disappearing microbiome. This disappearing microbiome has significant implications for human health. For example, lack of diversity or richness is associated with obesity, inflammation, various cancers, diseases of the colon, such as colon cancer and IBS, heart disease, and dementia. 
dietary intervention studies where they feed people more whole grains, as in the study where they fed subjects brown rice and barley, result in an increase in bacterial diversity. The combination of both brown rice and barley worked the best. Thus, variety is important. Markers of inflammation also went down. Diets high in fruits, vegetables, and other fiber-rich foods like beans, but not fiber supplements, are also associated with increased diversity of our gut microbiome. Thus, prebiotics feed our bacteria, and the more diverse sources of prebiotics that we can feed it, the better, and the more diverse our microbiome will be. They produce postbiotics, of which there are three main types, acetate, butyrate, and propionate. These are also known as short-chain fatty acids, and they impart a host of health benefits. For example, they help to regulate immune function, they suppress dangerous strains of bacteria like E. coli, they suppress inflammatory microbes, and they help to repair and protect against intestinal permeability or leaky gut. They also help in the regulation of blood glucose and satiety or appetite control. Thus, the more we can boost our production of these short-chain fatty acids, the better off we will be. In the words of Dr. Knight, who created the American Gut Project, the number of plant types in a person's diet plays a role in, in the diversity of his or her gut microbiome. Participants who ate more than 30 different plant types per week had gut microbiomes that were more diverse than those who ate 10 or fewer types of plants per week." End quote. To put it another way, the single greatest predictor of a healthy gut microbiome is the diversity of plants in one's diet. Words to live or eat by. In conclusion, there's no evidence that carbohydrate restricting diets are conducive to or even compatible with human health or longevity. There is instead bountiful evidence that the very foods such diets exclude are associated with improved gut diversity and gut health, less diabetes, cancer, heart disease, dementia, and premature, premature death. <laughs> Putting your health hopes on reducing consumption of a single macro or increasing your intake of another is silly at best and dangerous at worst. In the next video, I will talk about optimizing performance and recovery by reviewing the research on how much carbohydrate to ingest during training and competition. Thanks for watching and see you next time.